So everybody, let's get started. Um, so what did we talk about last time? Semaphore, log, and one concept, one very important concept in the assignment one. What is that? Critical section, right? So what is a critical section? Anybody? A shared, it's a section that has a shared resource. Yeah. Access to a shared resource. It doesn't have to have a shared resource, right? So a critical section is basically a piece of code that first of all, access the shared resource. And then secondly, that shared resource cannot be accessed at the same time by multiple threads, right? That's why we need to synchronization. And then, remember last time, the example we, we used, the printer example, right? The printer, one single printer cannot be used by multiple users at the same time. There has some to be, there has to be some synchronization or coordination happened at the printer side, right? So we talk about lock, and lock is the way or primitive to enforce this kind of mutual access, uh, mutual, exclu uh, mutual exclu exclusive concurrent access. And uh, we, lock has two primary interface. One is lock acquire, which indicate whichever thread call this lock acquire, that thread wants to sh access the shared resource or enter the critical section. And we have a lock release, which indicate the thread is done with the group section, and whoever wants to acquire the lock can, can go up and grab the lock, right? So uh, we don't talk about the details of the spin lock last time, right? We just show the interface of the spin locks. But I did cover the details of spin locks on Friday, so I will show it, uh, explain it in a little more details. So if you look at the code for spin lock, and remember what, what in, what's inside a spin lock structure? We have uh, holder information, which is the structure CPU pointer, and we have uh, uh, a variable indicating if this, is, this spin lock is available, right? So inside a spin lock acquire, uh, we first disable the interrupt so that no other thread on this CPU will compete the spin lock with me, right? Then we um, check the status of the spin lock. If it's available, then I set it to unavailable and I'm, I grab the spin lock. I'm done with this spin lock acquire, right? So, but if I come in and the, the lock status set is not available or this lock has been acquired by somebody else, then what do I do? There's no way channel in spin lock, right? Spin lock is the one which has already been provided to you. You have, you, you can look at the code of how the system implements spin lock. Spin lock, as the name suggests, this spins, right? So when it finds out the lock is not available, instead of doing smart things like in web channel and wake up and all that, you just keep paying the, the status, right? Keep spinning there until the lock is available. That's what the spin lock does, right? In the assignment one, you're supposed to implement another kind of lock which support exactly the same kind of interface, which is acquire and release, but with different mechanisms. In, so in the, in the lock acquire you, you implement, you are supposed to, instead of keep paying the lock status, you are supposed to put a thread to sleep. And later on, when other thread call lock release, you are supposed to wake that previous thread up, wake it up, right? That's what you are supposed to do in, for lock implementation. And the last time, we also talked about a semaphore, which, a way, which is the way to manage a set of resources. So in the lock, in the, in the case of lock, we only have one resource, right? Only one thread can inside the critical section. Now, in the case of a semaphore, we have a bunch of resources. So we can allow up to a certain number of threads in the critical section, right? So we go over, go, went over the code of the implementation of semaphore and we took look at how the semaphore uses a semaphore count to keep track of how many resources left, and how the semaphore uses a spin lock to protect the access to that semaphore count, right? So remember in the, in the function p, we first acquire the spin lock, then we check the count, right? If the count is zero, meaning no resource left, we, we do what? We put ourselves in the in web channel, right? After wake up, 
I acquire spin lock again and recheck the same account. That's what we do in the, in the, in the case of semaphore, right? Also, as we uh, said, the lock implementation is quite similar to semaphore. The, the procedure is quite similar if you think about it, right? So you have basically a status indicating if the lock is, uh, is available, right? You, you should have a lock, which is spin lock, to protect the access to that status, right? So inside lock acquire, what do you do? You first acquire this spin lock, which are supposed to protect the shared status. Then you check the status, right? If the status is not available, then you are supposed to put yourself in a web channel. And then very similar to what the semaphore does, when you wake up, you check the condition or check the lock status again and keep doing that. So this is uh, the hint we can get from semaphones to uh, how to implement normal locks or sleep version of the locks. Any questions before we uh, move on to CV and all that? Any questions? Yeah. Yes, basically a web channel is where a thread can wait. So a lock can have a web channel. That means whoever on this web channel are waiting for this lock. They're not waiting for something else, right? Imagine a system where you can have multiple locks. Each lock has its own web channel. Different thread may wait on different, different uh, locks, right? That's why each lock has its own web channels. Any other questions? So everybody got lock working? Everybody passed the SY2 test? Good. OK. So today, we, we're going to talk about a CV. We're going to talk about the uh, read the write lock. And we will talk about the synchronization problems. So first, CV. Um, the name itself is a little bit strange. So what is the condition variable? We have a condition in the name, right? So basically. In, in short, CV is a primitive that can let a thread temporarily give up the mutual access to a certain resource. Then the thread are supposed to go to sleep. After the thread wake up, it should regain the access to that, to that uh, mutual access. Right? This all may sound a little bit abstract to you. Uh, you so how many, of you have, how many of you have used a CV before? You have only one, so I guess that's most people have haven't used CV, right? So it's helpful to. So here's the thing about CV: the implementation is very straightforward. The comments in the header files tells you exactly what you need, what you need to do inside each CV wait or CV signal, right? If you go to the kernel uh, include the sync the edge. And you look at the comments around the CV function declaration, you will find the comments in saying what you are supposed to do inside each function. Right? It's very straightforward to, to implement. But it's not straightforward to understand the usage of the CV. Right? So to help you understand the usage of the CV, let's go over two examples of how you will use CV. One example is kind of interesting, that is that how will we use CV to implement semaphore? Remember what semaphore does. Semaphore inside P, you want to check the same account, which is a what? A condition, right? You are, you are counting on the condition that the same account is positive. If it's not, then you should wait for this condition, right? So think about it. How, you, how can you use CV to implement semaphore? So suppose you are given CV. You are supposed to implement a semaphore. How can you do that? Uh, I have a few markers. So let's try to do some coding on the, on the oh, it's, it's chalk. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> so P, OK? I'm going to write larger. OK, a function called p. Inside p, so uh, similar to the existing 
implementation, we still have a kind of status of the sample phone, which is the count of how many resources left in the, of this sample phone, right? We also we still have a count. We still have a lock to protect the access to the count. Now we also have a condition variable associated with this, this semaphore. So the first thing we do when we enter this P is what? Because you want to check the shared resource, what are you supposed? What do you what do you want to do at the first step? Grab the lock, right? So you lock. You acquire the semaphore lock here. Then what do you want to do? You want to check the lock, the semaphore status. Right? You want to check how many resources left. While this count equals to zero, that means you need to wait. Right? The resource is not available. How can you wait? Like I said, like we said, we use CV, right? CV has an interface called CV wait, which lets, lets you wait for a condition. The first argument should be the CV. The second argument, suppose it's L, is the lock. Right? Now remember what do you do inside of this CV wait? You fir first thing you do is give up the access to this lock. You want to call lock release. Now you can see why you want to call lock release inside a CV wait. Okay, now now you go to sleep. Right? After after you wake up, you call lock acquire. This is basically what you need to do inside a C uh, CV wait, right? So now you um, have some idea of why you need to call lock release before you go to sleep. The same reason why would we call lock release, spin lock release, uh, before we call web channel sleep, right? If you don't call rele lock release, now you are still holding the lock. Then you go to sleep. In that case, nobody else will be able to change the count or the status of the semaphore, right? You want to temporarily give up the mutual access to this count. So you give up here, you wait. You wait for some condition. And later on in the V function, somebody will wake you up. And when you wake up, you regain access to the lock, right? So this, this is what you do inside a CV wait. Now, after CV wait, the question is, do you still hold the lock? As far as this function concerns, no. You acquire the lock when you wake up, right? So this function as a whole doesn't change the status of the lock as far as this function concerns, right? Before I call this function, I have the lock. After I call this function, I still have the lock. Right? Because this function will acquire the lock for me, right? So this function doesn't change the ownership of the lock as far as the user concerns. Now, CV, after CV wait, I know that this count might be positive. The condition might, might be uh, um, true. So I go back and check the count again, right? So instead of the chunk of code you see in semaphore, I can use, just use one CV wait to achieve the same effect as what you, ha what you uh, have in the existing semaphore implementation. Right? And after that, after this while loop, I know that count is positive, so I call count minus minus. I decrement the count by one, and I release the lock, and I return. So this is the implementation of semaphore if you are given CV. Right? This, is, this is one example usage of the condition variable. Here, the condition being this count is positive. I'm waiting for this condition. As long as the condition is not true, I wait until this condition becomes true. Right? Now in the V function, you can imagine it's quite simple. You acquire the lock, you call CV signal to wake up somebody, you increment the count, you release the lock, then that's it. The V is always simple. Right? 
So now everybody understand how you can use CV to implement the semaphore. Any questions? Yeah. Well, you call this function because you want to acquire a resource, the oh. p function, right? If you don't want to acquire a resource, then you don't call this function at all. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions? OK, this, this is one example of how you can use CV to implement the sample. OK. A second example is kind of a classic synchronization problem, which called producer and consumer problem. Suppose you have a, a fixed sized buffer, right? With a size, say, n. Then you have a, a kind of thread which is called producer, which just produ keep producing item and put this, this item to the buffer until the buffer is full. And you have another type of thread which is called consumer, which just keep consuming items from the, this buffer until the buffer is empty, right? So this is the question set up. Now, suppose you are supposed to implement producer. How gonna you implement UCV? This is the, the example of CV that you can see in almost every OS textbook. So the basic idea of producer is that I produce item. I want to put the item in the buffer unless the buffer is or, or already full. In that case, I want to wait. So the condition for the producer want to wait is the buffer is not full. It has some capacity, right? So now think about it. How you uh, how you will implement the producer? Okay. Uh, So first, you get some item. I don't care how you get that. You have item. You want to put this item into the buffer, right? Now you want to acquire the lock for the buffer, because this buffer, in this case, is the shared resource, right? Before you try to put item in it, or you try to get item from it, you should acquire the lock to protect the access to the buffer, right? So lock, this lock for this buffer, right? Then you do what? You, can you just put item in, in the buffer? Why not? Do I care if it's empty? Why? As a producer, what do I care? If it's full, right? If it's full, then I cannot put item in it. Item in it. If it's empty, I don't care, right? So here, the condition you check is suppose this is the current size. As long as the size equals to the max, which means the buffer is full, I do what? CV weight, right? The first should be CV and the second should be lock. Now you see a pattern here when we use CV, right? We always use the CV in a loop. We want to keep checking that condition, right? So I acquire the lock for the buffer. I check the condition I care. In, in this case, the condition I care is if the buffer is full. As long as it's full, as long as it's buff the buffer is full, I keep waiting here. Remember, remember that in CV wait, what do we do? We release the lock. Why do we release the lock? This thing? Yeah, uh, the CV wait is a function. Okay. The first argument is variable called CV. Suppose we already have a CV declared it before that. The second argument is the lock. In this case, I named this lock as a buffer to, because it's the lock is to the lock is supposed to protect the buffer, 
right? Remember what we do in CV wait? You first release the lock. So the so if the buffer is full already, then I allow the consumer to consume item from the buffer to make it not full, right? I release the lock, I sleep. After wake up, I acquire the lock. So again, as far as this function, this um, producer concerns, after before CV wait, I have the lock, right? After CV wait, I still have the lock. Now I go back to the condition and check if the if it's still full. If it's full, then I keep waiting here. If it's not full, then great. I put the item in the buffer, release the lock, then I return. Right? This is the logic for the producer. Now, any questions before, before we go to the consumer case? So consumer is, the logic of consumer is quite similar. Right? So suppose I have a function called consumer. Right? The first thing I do is what? Acquire the lock. Acquire the lock for the buffer. Then what's the condition I care about as a consumer? If it's empty, right? So while the size, the buffer size, equals to zero, I call CV weight. Right? So here the condition changes. As the consumer, I don't care if the buffer is full or not. I only care if the buffer is empty. As long as it's not empty, I can consume. Otherwise, I cannot. Right? So the condition here I care about is the if it's empty. Now similarly, if it's not empty, then great. So I consume one item, item from the buffer, I, I release the lock. Then I'm done. Right? So these are two examples of how you can use semaphore to let a thread wait for a condition to happen, right? Now so you get a more sense of why it's called the condition variable. The condition variable itself doesn't have any conditions. The condition is up, outside, right? It depends on what you check on when you call CV wait. Yeah. Oh, CV? Yeah, because this function doesn't know which CV you want to wait on. Wait on right? You have to pass the CV as a first argument saying, I want to wait on this CV. And where would that come from? Like, where? Oh, we come, it comes from the er earlier on, but at the very beginning of the program, you may declare a CV equals to what CV create. So you create a CV in, in other places. Here we assume you already have a CV for the buffer or for the condition. Any other problem? So here you can imagine CV just as a web channel, right? But the web channel has something to do with an actual log, which it does something with the log. We first release the log, then sleep, then acquire the log again. Any other questions? So everybody understand how to use a CV property? You may, you may need to use CV in later uh, assignments, like for, for example in assignment one, in reader and writer log, you may want to use CV. Or in the um, while mating problem, you may also want to use CV. So CV is very useful for this, this kind of synchronization problems. OK? So. No questions? OK. Let's move on to reader and write lock. So the, you can imagine a reader and write lock as a special type of lock which allows multiple thread in the critical section as long as this thread does nothing but read, some, read the, the shared resource, as long as this thread doesn't change the status of the shared resource. Right? So intuitively, that's, that's correct, right? Because, for example, if I have a large database, 
you can imagine this database as all the books in the library, right? So because it's a shared database, so ev before everybody access the database, they have to grab some kind of lock to protect from each other, right? Suppose you are students. What you want to do is just to query the status of a book. You just want to read data from the shared resource, right? On the other hand, as the manager or the library, what she or he want to do is update the status of the book, right? She wanted to write to the database, and what you want to do is just to read from the database, right? So intuitively, multiple students should be able to read the database at the same time, right? It doesn't make sense to let you guys queue up and wait for each other, because what you want to do is just read. You, you won't do any harm, right? So, but once the, once the library or once, once the manager comes into the critical section where she wants to update the database, then nobody should be accessing the database because you may see inconsistent, inconsistent values, right? That's a typical example of where you can use reader and writer locks. So the idea is to, is the idea is you allow multiple readers in the critical section, but you only allow one writer in the critical section. Right, that's the concept of spin lock. Now, speaking of, speaking of uh, implementation, so what kind of problems you need to consider, or what kind of questions you need to ask yourself? So, a more a most important question is, what's the condition for a thread? You can allow a thread to enter a critical section, right? In uh, R W lock acquire read or R W lock acquire write. So when do you allow that thread to go through that function or return from that function? Obviously, we have some web channels inside web chan inside RW lock, right? Where you want to put the thread into sleep. So when do you uh, let the thread pass the acquire function? For readers, what's the condition? When a reader can come through the acquire and enter the critical section? No writer is holding the lock, correct? Yeah. No writer is holding the lock, is, that's partially correct. Okay, so if there is no writer in the critic section, a reader should be able to come in, right? And like I said, that's only partial correct, but for now, let's just take it as correct. So for readers, no writers inside, I can come in. For writers, what's the condition? No readers inside, what else? No writers, in, basically nobody inside, right? Yeah, so if readers inside, you cannot come in. If there are other writers inside, you can still not come in, right? Now let's go back to the condition for readers. You said as long as there is no readers inside, or as long as, sorry, as long as there is no writers inside, I can enter the critical section. That's that's what created the starvation problems. Let's see how we can starve a writer if you use that condition. So suppose this is time, right? We have a reader comes in, want to read, oh, no problem, nobody inside the critic section, and it comes into the critic section, enters the critic section. Now, later on, before this reader finishes, a writer comes. Can this writer come in the critic section? Yeah. No, because there is a reader inside, right? So before this reader finishes, again, another reader comes in. Can this reader enter? Yes, because there is no writers inside, right? Now, can this one enter, enter the critic section? Yes. Can this one enter the critic section? Yes. And it keeps going. What about this poor writer? It's going to wait until no one ever forever, like if I have readers come and go, if this writer will be starved, right? What, that's what we want to do, right? We want to stop these guys. As long as there is a writer before you, right? That's what you want to do in reader and write logs. 
to prevent rider starvation, right? So previously we say, as long as there is no readers, sorry, as long as there is no writers in sight, this reader can, can enter. That's not correct. What's the complete condition for this reader to enter? No writers inside or waiting, right? That's a complete condition for this reader to decide if this reader can enter the critical section. Okay, that's basically the only trick for read and write locks. Any <coughs> questions? Yeah. Okay, so what you're saying is, um, you mean we have a writer, we have a reader waiting here, we have another writer, you mean the writer keeps coming and going and starve the reader, is that a case? That's a good question, so. Um, so, here is the thing, so, if this writer is inside the critical section, and the re both readers and the writers are waiting for the critical section, when these writers are done, everybody should have a fair chance, fair chance to compete for the critical section. Right? You cannot always give the priority to writers. As you said, you will stop readers in that case. Right? So different from the previous case, when you have a writer inside the critical section, these guys Suppose these are writers. They cannot enter the query session anyway, right? They have to wait on this on this um, RW lock. So when this guy are down is down, he needs to wake up somebody, right? So these writers need to wake up somebody waiting on this RW lock. He should wake up everybody instead of just wake up the writers, right? If you just wake up the writers you are giving priority to writers, then you will stop the readers. Everybody get it, what I'm saying? Right? So when this writer is done with the critical section, everybody who are waiting for this uh, IW lock, whether it's a reader or writer, should get a fair chance to compete for the IW lock. Right? Suppose the reader grabs a lock, then what happened? Then these writers need to wait again wait any longer before the readers are finished, right? That's a good, good point, yeah. You don't, want to, you don't want to starve either the reader or the writer. Okay, yeah. So would the reader be able to acquire it because the writers are waiting, even though they're asleep, so like, would you define that differently? Uh, if you think about it, as actually it's two different conditions. So if um, if readers inside, and uh, the a uh, further readers want to come in, that readers want to check if the if there's writer waiting for it, to to avoid starving that writer, right? If there is writer inside, and the reader both reader and writer waiting for it then it's a different condition. You should, you should differentiate these two scenarios. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. No? Okay. So this is for reader and writer logs. Now uh, we have about 20 minutes to talk about the synchronization problems. So everybody have look at look at the synchronized problems problems. Everybody know what they are. So the the first problem is called well mating problem, which basically says that we have um, a bunch of thread, which you, which falls into three categories. One category is male, another is female, and another another is matchmaker, and. Uh, a a well mating need all three kind of wells. So you are supposed to use either CV semaphore or lock to coordinate between the wells to make the matching problem matching process smooth. 
basically what S is. Okay. So the uh, um, so what's the problem here? So what's the synchronization problem we are trying to solve here? So a mating requires all three of them, male, female, and a matchmaker, right? You want the you you want a match happening with all the presence with the presence of all three of them. In the output, if you see male start, female start, male end, female end, then you would know it's wrong because in that case the male and female finishes the process without a matchmaker. Right? That's that's how you can use your eyeball to tell the process is not correct. Right? Otherwise, um, you really don't know because because the male number one could be together with female number two or with with, with any females. You you never know. You all you can check is that the the male f the matching finishes with the presence of all three of them. How many of you have started working on this problem? You one, two, three, four. So you don't really know what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay. So anyway, um, it's not very hard. Just to remember that you need all three to make the ma make the mating happen. Okay. I mean, I won't talk about the, I won't teach recitation this Friday, so I don't have a chance to further explain the problem when, after you all have read it, but that's basically the idea of this problem. And the second one is more interesting or more easy to understand. By the way, how many of you have looked at the, have read the second question, the intersection, just read of don't have to do this, any coding of it. Just know what the problem is. Still less than half. Okay. Anyway, so the, the, the second question says like this. Suppose we have an uh, intersection, and that intersection is a four-way stop. Basically, you will see a sign like this with all way here. Right? All way stop. <coughs> It's a two-lane road, and what you want to do is suppose you have a bunch of autonomous cars, which, which is driven by computers, and you are supposed to design programs for these computers to pass this four-way stop correctly. Correctly mean no car crash, and everybody follow the rules. So for example, we have four directions, zero, one, two, three, right? So suppose a car coming from this direction and one, one, two, go straight. Now we're naming this quadrant accordingly. Oh, sorry, I labeled the quadrants wrong. This should be zero, one, two, three. This quadrant is zero, one, Two, three. Okay. So suppose a car comes from this direction and I want to go straight. Which two quadrant this car will come across? Two, two and three. This is intuitive, right? What about turn right? Only one quadrant. Two. Right? What about turn left? Instead of two and zero, you should go to two, three and zero. Right? Two, three, zero. You need a quite three quadrants to pass this uh, correct section. So the requirement of your program is, first of all, safety, right? No more than two cars should be in the critic or actually no more than one car should be in one quadrant at any time, right? Otherwise, you have an accident. That's number one requirement, safety, right? Basically, you have four quadrant, and each of them is is a shared resource. Basically, you have four pieces of shared resource. Right? That number one requirement, safety. It's exclusive access. Right? 
Number two, okay, I'll write down here. Number two is efficiency. What's the first solution you come up when you hear about this about this problem? Anybody? Now, what's, what's the first, yeah? Uh, no, what's the very first idea you come up if you want to solve, solve this problem? No, the, smart, the computer is not that smart. Yeah. Exactly, I have one big lock for this, for this whole intersection, right? In that case, it's safe, only one car coming in any of the quadrant, but it, it is correct, right? But it's not good in the sense of efficiency, right? <coughs> Suppose I have two cars uh, coming into opposite directions, one from here, one from here. They, are, they should be able to cross the intersection at the same time, right? It's different than a real uh, four-way stop. Cars can start at the same time if they don't collide, right? Or in the most extreme case, I have four cars coming at four directions and all of them want to turn right. They should be able to make the turn at the same time instead of for all of them waiting for each other, right? So this is what we mean by efficiency. Actually, in the, in the grading, um, the grader will try to identify if you use a one big lock solution and give you and uh, take some points off for that. So don't even try that. Or if you don't really have time, you, you can use it, it's correct. It's just not, not that works very well, right? So this is the second requirement, efficiency, which basically is, excludes the possibility where you have a one big lock for each quadrant. And the third requirement is liveness. What do we mean by liveness, okay? Two cars coming from, um, from, okay, suppose one car comes from here and he wants to turn left, okay? Another car comes here and he also wants to turn left. Oh, that won't create a, a dialog. But anyway, let's make the scene a, a much more interesting. We have four cars coming at each direction and all of them want to turn left. Okay, so this car come here, enter this uh, quadrant, okay, because nobody is inside. This car enters here, this car enters here, and this car enters here. And what's next? Everybody gets stuck, right? Everybody gets stuck, there's no way out. Unless you're human, you're smart, you back off and let, some, let some, some, somebody else pass. But for computer, they're dumb, they're, they're, so they don't know how to back up, they get stuck here. So what do you want to try to avoid is this, exactly this kind of situa situation. What's that? Yeah, that, it is called deadlock, technically. But you can... <laughs> yeah. this. So, this is the requirement for this intersection problem. And you can use any of the CV semaphore lock to try to solve this problem and try to enforce the, uh, the synchronization or the coordination between the cars. Any other problem about this question? Yeah? No, you don't want to use spin lock after lock. Once you have a lock working, you always want to just use the lock you implemented. Any other questions? So everybody know how to solve this problem?
Well, I didn't actually tell you that, but <laughs> you should have some idea. So first of all, what kind of primitive you want to use? You have to use one of lock and semaphore, right? To ensure that kind of mutual access, mutual exclusive exclu exclu access, right? Lock is ideal fit in this case because it doesn't make sense to have a semaphore for each quadrant with the initial count one. Right? That's basically a lock. Right? So you should have some lock for each quadrant. And uh, what else? Yeah. Maybe. Yeah, you may use some condition variable. Say the condition could be all the quadrant on my parts are empty. That could be one condition, right? Or there is, what's that? That also depends on your direction. I mean, the parts you are, you are going to use depend on the direction where you come, right? Come from. So minimum, you should use a lock. And how to use them, you need to figure out, right? But whatever solution you come up with, check these three conditions. Make sure you're taking care of them. <coughs> All right? Yeah. What's co what condition? Rest condition? If you implement the lock correctly, you won't have any rest conditions. Right? Yeah. No, no. Yes. <laughs> this is just a kind of simulation. Of course, in practice, it's not just to go over there instantaneously. But we assume that. Yeah. Yeah. For this lock, you know, whether the threads are going left or right? If you look at the code in the function call, it tells you where this car comes from and where this car is going. So you know exactly which quadrant you will use. Yeah. OK, I guess that's it. So thanks, and good luck with the assignments.